chapter 25 is not about a body system. It's about metabolism and energetics. And they purposefully placed it at this location in the book because we just finished the digestive system. So we're really taking digestion one step further and saying, hey, those molecules that you were able to absorb in the small intestine, what are we actually doing with them? Okay. So in this chapter, um, there's some big picture things that we're going to look at, and there is a lot of minutia. I'm going to try to not get too lost in the weeds there, but you really do need to understand some very cellular processes of how the body is fueling itself. So that's where we're heading. Um, so where we start out, when someone says metabolism, what does that make you think of? So for a lot of us, maybe it's something to do with energy or we think of uh, people having a fast metabolism, slow metabolism, maybe it gets into things like diet, weight loss, things like that. Really, on the nerdy end of things, right, what we're looking at is metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions that happen in the body, right? It's just all the chemical reactions that happen in the body. Now, what we do is we break those reactions down into two camps, right? We have catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. All of those together, that's metabolism. Now, catabolic reactions, it's true, they release energy, but more importantly than that, a catabolic reaction takes a complex molecule and turns it into something that is more simple. Something more complex and turning into something more simple. So, for example, we were talking about in the digestive system taking maybe a protein, right, polypeptide, long chain of amino acids, and breaking it into individual amino acids, right? That would be an example of a catabolic reaction, right? Or taking uh, starch and turning it into glucose, right? Breaking it down into something smaller more simple, okay? Now, what they're looking at here is a very specific catabolic reaction, and that's cellular respiration. Right? Still a catabolic reaction, but this time we're taking glucose, right, which is a fairly complex molecule, right? burning it in the presence of oxygen, and we're going to release CO2 and H2O, right? If you want, we're not there yet, but there's oxygen on this side, right? We're taking this complex molecule and turning it into carbon dioxide and water, right? Much simpler than this. In fact, I haven't even drawn the whole thing out here. We have a bunch of H's, OH's. You do not need the gory details there, right? Complicated, simple. That is a catabolic reaction. Now, catabolic reaction, release energy. The term for releasing energy is exergonic. So typically, I think of catabolic dealing with the matter, complex to simple, and exergonic talking about the energy. So it is important to understand, right, particularly we'll focus in here on cellular respiration, that we are taking energy that's found in all of these bonds, right, these are all carbons in here, in these bonds, and we're just reshuffling it so that the energy that comes out the other side is in the form of ATP. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's merely changing forms. So we're taking it from the bonds in sugar and we're putting it into the bonds of ATP. Okay, so that's catabolic reactions. Now, anabolic reactions, do the opposite. Anabolic reactions are going to take simple 
molecules, they're often talking about the building blocks, simple molecules, and making something more complex. So an anabolic reaction takes something simple and builds a more complex molecule. You take amino acids, you put them together in the form of proteins. You take fatty acids, there's an example I didn't use on the catabolic side, but I could have. Fatty acids, you can build right, a triglyceride. Right, which is a lipid. Okay, you can put glucose molecules together to make glycogen, etc. Right, taking something simple and making it more complex. Now, to do this does require energy. That kind of reaction is called endergonic, energy requiring. So again, anabolic. Typically, think of the matter building something. Um, the energy side of things, it requires energy. It's endergonic. So. This ends up being our connecting piece in here, where catabolic reactions like cellular respiration are going to put energy in the form of ATP. That is a form that cells are able to use to drive these anabolic processes and make more complicated molecules, right? But all of that together is metabolism. If we look at this, oh, sorry. So one other thing uh, to keep in mind then, if you're having trouble with anabolic, catabolic, I always think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He was taking anabolic steroids to get huge, right? To build up that muscle. So anabolic steroids, bodybuilding, um, right? Building up. Catabolic, I, you picture like a little cat tearing things apart. I don't know, whatever works for you. Um, okay, so here's another way um, to look at it. So notice here in the center, we have this so-called nutrient pool. In this pool, and they do mean like swimming pool, a vat of nutrients, this is where our little building blocks are. Amino acids, lipids, simple sugars like glucose, right? We can basically do two different things here. When you have amino acids in your nutrient pool, you can decide, hey, do I want to build a protein? Right? Um, or do I want to use that nutrient in order to get ATP out of it? Am I going to run it through cellular respiration? And here's the thing. These anabolic reactions are super important. Look at all this. Maintenance and repair. Right? Any damage that's happening to tissues, you need to build molecules to, to repair that, um, to grow secretions. Right? You don't just like Antibodies don't come out of it nowhere. If a B lymphocyte wants to secrete antibodies, well then in that nutrient pool, you better have the amino acids that it needs, right? So that's what we're doing here. Um, stored nutrient reserves, right? If we have enough glucose in the nutrient pool, we can make glycogen, right? Or fatty acids into triglycerides, etc. Okay. They're also showing that, hey, when you have triglycerides, when you have lipid reserves, you can pull them back out, put that in the nutrient pool, right? That is why we carry adipose, is to have the ability to refill this nutrient pool with fatty acids and get ATP when we need it. Okay, so the other thing I want you to notice um, from this figure, right, is, we'll, and this is, we'll go through excruciating detail, this aerobic metabolism that takes place um, in the presence of oxygen in the mitochondria, right? When we're trying to capture the energy that's in those nutrients, the carbs, lipids, proteins, about 40% of that is actually converted into ATP. More than half is lost in the form of heat, right? So in every conversion of energy, some goes to lesser quality. That's actually the second law of thermodynamics, you get into entropy. But this idea that it's not 100% efficient, even an amazing organelle like the mitochondria is not 100% um, efficient. Um, this heat coming out of our body is often uh, in the form of doing things like running sodium potassium pumps. Anyway, um, so what they're showing here, right, is a lot of this is coming off as heat and the rest of it the cell is going to use to do work. Right? Either that cell needs to move around, skeletal muscle, maybe we're thinking about 
um, contraction, um, moving things within the cell organelles actually get transported, um, and none of this happens for free, right? Again, uh, bulk transport and no cytosis, exocytosis, right? So big picture, if you get lost in the weeds at all, big picture, we are trying to turn food into ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? And adenosine, remember in DNA, RNA, you have A's, right? That's adenosine triphosphate. Uh, in, in DNA, it's adenine, so it's a slightly different version, but it's basically the same thing. It's a sugar and then a nitrogenous base, right? adenosine, and then it has three tri, three phosphates attached to it. It's the bonds between these molecules that are holding the energy, and we'll look at that, right? Um, we can use that energy to drive anabolic reactions, right? Putting amino acids into the form of protein. We can use ATP to run sodium potassium pumps. Here's the picture. I hope that shows up pretty well. This is like, like an organelle that's being drug across the cytoskeleton. And this is a motor protein. It's actually walking along the cytoskeleton and dragging this big organelle like it's a blimp um, inside of the cell. So cells, the inner life of cells, they have all sorts of things that they actually want to do with ATP. And so we try to provide that. So, when we look at cellular respiration, right, again, here is your nutrient pool. We are going to follow cellular respiration through the way that glucose is used, right? That's kind of the, the typical way to do it. But I do want you to realize that fatty acids, that one maybe is more obvious, and amino acids can also be run through cellular respiration. Now, I do like this image in blue here. They're showing anabolic reactions, the building reactions, right? When we use those, that nutrient pool to, to build a more complex molecule, it's anabolic. But a lot of times, right, we might be tearing that apart, little cat, catabolism, right? Tearing that apart, um, running it through cellular respiration, um, and hopefully coming out with the ATP for cells to do their work. Okay, before we dive into the nitty gritty of cellular respiration, there's three main types of reactions that you need to recall from Bio 111. So hopefully you remember your redox reactions. These are reduction and oxidation reactions. Isn't that cute? They made a little contraction, redox. They do this because one cannot happen without the other, right? So a reduction reaction is anytime electrons are gained. Right, so gaining electrons. You can't gain electrons unless someone else gives them up, right? These have to go together. And so oxidation is a reaction where electrons are given up or lost, right? Now, you just have to memorize this, right? So reduction is gain. Oxidation is lost. Oil, rig. If that works for you, great. Lose electron, mm, I'm on the wrong side. Lose electrons, oxidation. Gain electrons, reduction. Leo the lion says grr. Okay, whatever you need to do um, to memorize this. But these are gonna happen together. So one molecule is going to give up electrons someone else is going to pick those electrons up. Okay, so that's two of our reductions. The third then is phosphorylation. Phosphorylation. Okay, this is the addition of a phosphate group. This happens when we take adenosine diphosphate and we add another phosphate, making ATP, right? So if you take adenosine 
diphosphate and you want to stick a third phosphate on there, right? Now here's the thing. Phosphate groups are all negatively charged. Have you ever tried to put like two negative ends of a magnet together? They're just repelling each other, right? So this has a negative and this, that is a P, this has a negative. When you're trying to put them together, it's not easy. It's actually going to require a lot of force to cram that last phosphate on there, but then it's like a loaded spring. When the cell wants to use the energy that's now stored in that bond, right, that energy can come back out. I like to think of this reaction as like setting a mouse trap, right? It takes a lot of energy to pull that bar over, right? And you secure it, but when that bar comes free, bam, kill a mouse or catch your big toe or whatever happens there, right? So the energy is in these bonds. It's technically in these as well, but the big one is this conversion from ADP to ATP. When a cell uses the energy, in ATP, it does a dephosphorylation reaction. It pops one of those phosphates off, and we go back the other way, right, to being ADP and phosphate. So phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, okay? So what we're gonna see is that cellular respiration is really just a series of redox reactions, and at the very end, all these electrons that we're grabbing and donating and picking up and letting go of are going to provide the energy necessary for phosphorylation. Couple last thoughts before we jump in. Chemist, technically reduction and oxidation is with an electron and that's how chemists talk about it a lot. For a biologist, the, the electron is on hydrogen, right? So if you think back to chemistry, hydrogen with its atomic number of one, Hmm? has a single proton and a single electron, typically, right? So if you think about how that's oriented, you have one proton in the nucleus and then a single electron following it. So when we're following electrons, it's on this hydrogen. So you'll often just see hydrogen moving around. There was one other thing I wanted to tell you. Um, this will probably help. So the other thing then, we'll see a lot of what we call electron carriers. So they're going to pick up the hydrogens um, off of one molecule and deliver them to the electron transport chain. And those molecules that you'll see over and over again are NAD. And NAD is willing to gain an electron. It gets reduced, and then we'll see it in this form of NADH. See the electron that it gained, right? When we've carried that electron to the electron transport chain, we will go back to NAD, right? That, uh, that hydrogen is going to go elsewhere. And this is an oxidation reaction, right? We lost that electron. So NAD, NAD is nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. I don't care if you memorize it. It's based off of niacin. So if you've seen niacin on a nutrition label, that's what it's for. The other electron carrier that we're gonna see is FAD, flavin adenide dinucleotide. This is based off of riboflavin, okay, another vitamin. Um, same thing, it's willing to get reduced, it carries that electron, and then it gets oxidized later back uh, to the FAD form. Okay, I think we're ready to dive into cellular respiration. Aerobic cellular respiration has four steps. Those are glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation,
That's also sometimes called the linking step. Third is the citric acid cycle. Also known as the Krebs cycle. And fourth is oxidative phosphorylation. Think about that fourth step. It tells you what's going to happen. A bunch of stuff is going to lose electrons, and that is going to drive the production of ATP, the phosphorylation, the addition of the phosphate. And this really happens kind of in an A and a B step. Um, you have the electron transport chain. Electron transport chain or electron transport system, everybody's favorite, followed by chemi osmosis. Okay? Those are the four steps that we are going to use to help um, oxidize the glucose. Okay? So in cellular respiration, so again, those are your four steps, basically what we need, we can still see this, right? We are going to take glucose and again you can use proteins you can use lipids but the simplest way is to look at glucose first um, in the presence of oxygen in this case it's actually six oxygen I don't care so much that you know exactly how many right and through these four steps that's what this arrow is indicating we are going to get to the point where we have co2 water and ATP, the energy that we are going for here. Now, the reason that I put these numbers here, some people really um, like this, right? So for example, if you count on this side, if you have six CO2, O2, two times six is 12, and there's another six oxygen here, there's 18, oxygens on this side. Do you see where I got that? So on this side, right, there are six here. If I just put O2, right, you'd be like, oh, there's eight over here. Technically, there are six oxygens. So there's 12 and another six. That's 18. For me, you do not need to balance it. You could just tell me glucose plus oxygen, CO2, water. But for some of you, it's going to make more sense to be making sure that you have the right numbers so that you can check yourself. Either way is fine with me here, right? So cellular respiration, basically what we're doing, right, is we are going to oxidize glucose. We are gonna rip all of those electrons, all of the hydrogens off. This is an oxidation. See that? See how they're similar, but this side there's no hydrogens? Hmm. We've removed the electrons. Where do we put the electrons? We stick them all on oxygen. Oxygen is willing to take those electrons, and it becomes reduced. This reduction reaction, adding hydrogens to oxygen, gives us water. Right? So it's one big redox reaction. Now, this is the same reaction that happens if you throw a log on a bonfire, right? That log is a bunch of cellulose. It's a bunch of glucose molecules stuck together. And as long as there's oxygen, it can burn. It can release massive amounts of energy and CO2, global warming, and water, right? You don't see the water because it's water vapor, but it's there. It's the same reaction, except you don't want to be a bonfire. You don't want to spontaneously combust. We are going to go ahead and do this in a stepwise, like pace it on out kind of reaction so that we can capture that energy and not light on fire. All right, our first step is glycolysis. The name tells you what's going on. We are lysing, we're splitting glucose. So we are going to take our glucose molecule, right? C6H6O2, 
page 1206, okay, and we are going to split it in half into a molecule called pyruvate. We'll get two of them. Glucose is a six carbon molecule. Pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. So there's two of them, we've split it in half, okay? I use the dots to keep track of carbons. Some people rather just write um, six carbon, you know, three carbon, three carbon. Figure out what works best for you, right? But I do want you to know that this glucose is split into a molecule called pyruvate. Now, here is the process by which it happens. You don't need to know this for me. If you take biochemistry, you will have to know um, these steps, right? For me, I'm much more interested in, when I look at cellular respiration, I wanna know where the carbon is going, where the electrons are going, right, the hydrogens, and where are we actually achieving our goal of getting energy, getting ATP? So in glycolysis, notice there's our six carbon glucose. Here are our two three carbon pyruvates, right? So that's where the carbon is. In this process, we also actually get two ATP. Now, notice up here they're saying, well, two ATP come in, two ATP are made, two ATP are made, Overall, we get two ATP. If you wanna know the ins and outs, that is fine, but I want you to know the end result here of this reaction is two ATP. Now, sometimes students go, wait, it just like came out of nowhere? No, technically, you had two ADP, right? And you had two phosphates, and you had enough energy to go ahead and put them together in the form of ATP. If you need that for this to make sense, go for it. But if you can say, oh, in the process of glycolysis, two ATP are made, I'm also fine with that. The other thing is that we went ahead and took a couple electrons. So notice here, we have that NADH. It's in its reduced form. It's already gained those hydrogens. It didn't come from nowhere. We had NAD and we ripped, we oxidized partially our glucose. I need you to know that two NADH are produced in glycolysis. If you want to know that there were two NAD and they gained two hydrogens, that's fine. Okay? So in glycolysis, we get two pyruvate, two ATP, and two NADH. It's a little bit of a... What do you call it when you give away the end of the movie? I have no idea. These electrons are going to the electron transport chain. Keep an eye out. We will see these again at our fourth and final step, okay? So that's glycolysis. Okay, let's move on to step number two, which is not labeled on here, but is pyruvate oxidation. Pyruvate oxidation is essentially right here. This is the citric acid cycle. This is pyruvate oxidation. So what we're doing is we're taking our two pyruvate, which you'll recall came out of glycolysis, two three carbon molecules, and we are going to convert them into two acetyl CoA. What you need to know is that those are two carbon molecules. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons. Over here we have six carbons, over here we have four carbons. That math doesn't work out. One of the things that happens in pyruvate oxidation is that you breathe off two CO2. So already we're this early, you are already exhaling your Pop-Tart or your chicken sandwich or whatever on your neighbor, two CO2, okay? We also grab two more hydrogens, two more electrons. Those are gonna go 
to the electron transport chain. Okay? So 2 acetyl CoA, 2 CO2, 2 NADH. We didn't make any energy in this step, and that's okay. We'll get there eventually. So that's pyruvate oxidation. Third, citric acid cycle. Okay, there is a lot going on in the citric acid cycle. It's actually a series of eight different enzymatically driven steps that you don't need to know for me. Again, if you take biochem, you will learn all those intermediaries. But what we're interested in is the carbon, the energy, i.e. ATP, and the electrons. So here we go. In the citric acid cycle, what's gonna happen is we feed an acetyl-CoA molecule in. Our acetyl-CoA has how many carbons? Two. It is going to get picked up at the beginning of the cycle by a molecule called oxaloacetate. This is a four carbon molecule, oxaloacetate. One, two, three, four. Four carbons plus two carbons gives us a six carbon citric acid. Hence the name, citric acid cycle. Now, if you're going, wait a second, glucose was six carbon and we broke it apart, how are we back to six carbon? Realize that what's going to happen is that your four carbon oxaloacetate picked up your two carbon acetyl-CoA to make citric acid, right? There's my, my six carbons. But in this process, I'm gonna get rid of those two carbons as carbon dioxide and it's a cycle because you come right back around to the oxaloacetate. In the process of doing this, here we go. Here's our CO2s, right? We are going to breathe off both of those carbons, okay? So let's see. Uh, how do I write this? Acetyl-CoA goes in, right? And then what we're going to get out, it's not a direct conversion anymore, but those carbons are leaving as two CO2, right? Acetyl-CoA was a two carbon molecule. Each CO2 is a single carbon, but we breathe them, two of them, off. Okay, we also, as this cycle goes around, produce one ATP. Now it's technically a closely related molecule called GTP. I don't care, it's energy, ATP is fine. We also grab a ton of electrons, right? See all these hydrogens that they're showing all over the place? As this cycle goes around, we get three NADH, right? And one FADH. There finally is that um, FADH that we mentioned earlier. There it is. Okay? All of these electrons, all the FADHs, NADHs, are going to the electron transport chain. Okay? But that is what happens in citric acid. Now, if you'll remember from pyruvate oxidation, we had two acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA comes in, we get two CO2, one ATP, three NADH, one FADH, and then this has to go around again for the other acetyl-CoA. So per molecule of glucose, this has to run twice. I don't care if you say this times two, or if you say, hey, in the citric acid cycle, um, per glucose we get four CO2, two ATP, six NADH, and two FADH. Either way is gonna get you to the correct math, right? So either way works there. Okay, I'm already looking forward to questions. When we talk about this, all right, here comes the big one. And I say the big one because if you go back through, yeah, take a moment and do this. Go back through. How many ATP have we made so far? In these first three steps, how many ATP do you have? Did you get to four? 
we should have gotten two ATP in glycolysis, and then we just got two out of the citric acid cycle. So we have four ATP. That is not enough for our cells with our high metabolic rate, our, our body temperatures being maintained. Um, it's not gonna get us there. We need a lot more ATP. And that is where oxidative phosphorylation comes into play. So fourth and final step, which we said we can break into two, is oxidative phosphorylation. We're gonna steal electrons and use the energy to make ATP. And so here, here it is. So we're in the mitochondria, and what they're trying to point out here is recalling that the mitochondria has this inner membrane, right? And that inner membrane is where this magic takes place, right? So there's a space out here, and then this membrane. Now embedded in this membrane is a series of proteins. This is the electron transport chain. And so what is gonna happen here, and I'm trying to decide if this is maybe too small. I'll draw you one. Inner membrane here. I'm just putting some proteins in. That's actually like the correct number of proteins. I'm just throwing some in here, right? What we're gonna do is all the NADH and FADH that comes uh, to this electron transport chain is going to get oxidized. It's going to lose its electrons and go back to NAD. Now, this hydrogen, remember we said it was a proton and an electron. This protein, this enzyme, is actually going to rip it apart so that the proton comes and sits out in this inner membrane space, right? And the electron gets handed down this series of proteins and eventually dropped back into um, this inner space, the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay. Now, oxidation. We said there was the electron transport chain or electron transport system, if you see ETFs, that's what they're going for, and chemiosmosis. This is the electron transport chain, right? So again, we're oxidizing. Now we need to phosphorylate. So what happens is you have one more protein embedded in this membrane. And this protein is called ATP synthase. What do you suppose it does? If you said synthesize ATP, you were correct. So here's the deal. All these protons that are in this inner membrane space, remember diffusion, molecules want to spread out. They are trapped on this side of the membrane. They can't get through. The only place that's going to allow them to pass down their concentration gradient back into the matrix is ATP synthase. So these protons start coming back in here and when they do, they literally turn this protein like it's a turbine, right? And the energy from that protein turning is going to go into forcing that final phosphate on. So ATP synthase is taking ADP and phosphate and making ATP, right? Pushing that last phosphate on. This is crazy. The analogies here are crazy. This, this membrane, it's a dam. This pile of protons on this side, it's the reservoir of water sitting behind the dam. The only place the water can get down the hill to the other side is through a giant turbine. What do we get? Electricity, right? So there's energy there. There's potential energy when you have something trapped in this massive concentration on one side of a wall instead of the other, okay? And that drives the production of ATP. Oh, so much ATP. Now, before we talk about that, this electron 
and this proton, hydrogen, need to go somewhere. If these protons start building up in the matrix, right, and we reach equilibrium, we no longer have chemiosmosis. We no longer have the flow of those protons across the membrane. So we need someone to take this. That someone is oxygen. Oxygen plus two electrons plus two protons, I don't even know how I want to write that, whatever, I'm writing it like that, right, gives you H2, right, there's our 2O. And a lot of books will write this as one half of oxygen, because technically just O doesn't hang out by itself, whatever. Oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. It is the final electron acceptor, and by taking that at the end, by willing uh, to be reduced, right, oxygen gets reduced into water, remember that from our first equation, by gaining all of those electrons, it means that this can keep happening. If your oxygen supply gets cut off, no oxygen to take those electrons, this whole thing backs up, you stop making ATP. Isn't that weird? We think of aerobic respiration. We no, need oxygen. We don't even use it until this fourth and final step of cellular respiration, right? But there it is, and it becomes water, okay? There's our turbine. I pulled that picture from uh, the Gen Bio textbook just because I think it does a pretty nice job of showing that hydrogen coming through and then the ATP synthase using that energy to create ATP. There are lots of visualizations, lots of different ways to think about cellular respiration. This is one out of a, a micro textbook. It's showing you um, glycolysis here, uh, pyruvate oxidation here, Krebs cycle here, and it's just listing oxidative phosphorylation um, over here. But what's nice, what they're pointing out, out of this is all the NADH, right, from glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and Krebs cycle, that's going to um, oxidative phosphorylation, right? So that's a visualization um, that helps you. Um, the other thing that I would say is that as far as the total output, books are gonna have different numbers. In fact, I don't know even what your book um, says on that one, right? Typically, it'll say somewhere around, um, I've seen anywhere from like 24 to 30, um, ish. We will double check your book and talk about that in class. Um, and part of the reason that there's some variation, it drives me nuts, right? I teach Gen Bio, this, Micro, they all have different numbers and it's really a rounding issue. So basically it comes down to, I kind of like the way these guys are putting it, um, for each NADH, right, the electrons as they're being carried, that has about enough energy um, to make three ATP, right? It's not becoming three ATP, it's just handing off the energy. The FADH is around two, I mean, we're gonna get rid of the arrows, two ATP, right? And so um, if you do the math, then that this one would be saying 32, um, 34, 34 ATP coming out of oxidative phosphorylation, and then the four we went into there, and so that's where they're getting this 38 um, maximum, okay? Um, but you should be around those numbers. You should realize that it's way more than anaerobic respiration, which gives you two ATP, because it's just glycolysis, okay? But when you see different numbers in different books, it's just rounding that goes into this. Um, the, AT, the NADH from glycolysis has to get transported into the mitochondria. That has slightly different values, um, et cetera. Okay. So we were looking at aerobic respiration in the mitochondria with glucose. This is a much bigger picture um, of glucose metabolism. So again, in red are gonna be catabolic reactions and blue are anabolic reactions. So notice what happens here, right? We have glucose, 
we can either do glycogenesis, we can make glycogen, glucose to glycogen, right, to store it for later. This is glycogenesis, right, the creation of glycogen. Or we can take glycogen and do um, glycogenolysis and go back to glucose. The backwards error is confusing, write it again and say glycogen to glucose is glycogenolysis, right? But we can do that either way. And so you see a lot of these reactions going um, back and forth. Overall, we know glycolysis is catabolic, right? We're tearing it apart. But remember in the liver, we talked about gluconeogenesis. Could we come up with more words that sound identical? Right? But again, origins of new glucose. We said this was making glucose from a non-glucose source, so from lipids um, or proteins. Right Now notice, basically from pyruvate up, we're able to run that direction. Right? We actually have the enzymes to do these anabolic reactions. We do not have the enzyme to go from acetyl-CoA back to pyruvate. Right? So once we cross this pyruvate border, we're no, not going back, we're then able to store acetyl-CoA as something like a lipid. Right? But gluconeogenesis, um, basically, again, uh, lipids or proteins. Okay? How about lipid metabolism? Okay. So we know that glucose is not the only source of energy. In fact, lipids are an even better source of energy. You get nine kilocalories per gram instead of four that you get for a carbohydrate. So here they're showing you a triglyceride, right? The triglyceride is the storage form of lipid. On the end here, right, this is glycerol, and then we have three fatty acid chains, okay? So that triglyceride is gonna get ripped apart. The three carbon glycerol looks just like pyruvate, and so it gets run through the same way. But the fatty acids, we are going to use a process called beta oxidation to break down these fats to use for energy. And so basically what we're doing, there's a lot going on here, but notice these fatty acid chains, like I usually just draw them like that, but each intersection, right, there's actually a carbon, that carbon has hydrogens coming off of it, but the thing that ends up happening is there's not oxygen, and that actually gives us a lot more energy, a lot more bonds that we can break. And what we do is we break this fatty acid chain off two carbons at a time, right? This is acetyl-CoA and gets fed into um, citric acid cycle. And then we come back and we rip the next two carbons off. We stick this coenzyme A, and we have acetyl-CoA. So beta oxidation, we're ripping a fatty acid apart, two carbons at a time, as acetyl-CoA, and stoking the old metabolic fires, okay? With lipids, remember we did say that the liver was super important here, but they're walking us through a bit about how lipids are used. So this is a good time to recall from the digestive system that in order for a lipid to be absorbed by that endothelial cell, it needed to be in the form of a micelle, right? This is how they're absorbed. We kind of then crack them open, see what's inside, all these fatty acids. We repackage it into triglycerides, right? And we package it into what is called a chylomicron. Chylomicron. Again, that happens in that intestinal endothelial cell. Recall, this moves into the lacteal, not the capillary, but into the lacteal. From there, we'll eventually make it into the bloodstream. And now we have a great fuel for either skeletal muscles or we send this to adipocytes. And in adipocytes, we're gonna take those triglycerides and store them for later, right? Here, they're reminding us that the liver, your friend the liver, is the site of all 
metabolic regulation. And so when the liver gets these chylomicrons, it gets to decide what to do. It can build LDLs. And if you recall, LDLs are delivering lipids into the bloodstream. The liver can also produce HDLs, which go ahead and scavenge that leftover lipid, right? And bring it back to um, the liver for repackaging. Right? So this is a really nice um, diagram to describe how we're transporting and using those lipids. And that leaves us with proteins, right? And so how we use amino acids. So here's the thing, right? You have 20 different amino acids that you need to use in order to build a proper protein, okay? A lot of them you can actually build through the process either of amination or transamination, right? So amination, you're taking essentially a carbohydrate and you're adding the nitrogen, that makes it an amino acid. In transamination, you're basically just switching who has the amine group, right? So we're gonna take it off of this guy and put it onto this sugar, and that makes us this amino acid tyrosine, okay? There are nine amino acids that you are incapable of doing amination or transamination with. We call those essential amino acids. They have to be in your diet. Okay. The other thing that we can do with amino acids is we can burn them in cellular respiration essentially as a carbohydrate. But to do that, we have to take off that amine group, right? This then essentially looks like a sugar to the body and can be used as that fuel. Deamination though is going to leave us with ammonia. Ammonia is a toxic waste product that in our body we're going to convert to urea for the kidneys uh, to get rid of. Okay. Now, when you eat and overnight, your body behaves very differently. So we're gonna talk about the absorptive state. So what's happening when you're actually eating meals like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and what happens overnight when you have a good eight hours or so when there's no food present, right? Cells behave very differently. So in the absorptive state, we'll zoom in here, notice they're showing you lipids, glucose, and amino acids. In that absorptive state, all of these mm, nutrient pool are elevated, okay? And look at what happens here. Blue lines are anabolic, red lines are catabolic. So you absolutely now have all this fuel and you can go ahead and run cellular respiration and grab a bunch of ATP. So we do see catabolic reactions happening here, but there are also a lot of anabolic reactions, right? So plenty of glucose in the cell, the presence of insulin, insulin is an anabolic hormone that will drive glycogen production. Plenty of fatty acids, um, coming in from the meal, insulin's presence, anabolic, helps us build triglycerides. Same thing with amino acids to proteins. Insulin, androgens, estrogens, and growth hormone, all helping us anabolically encourage the production of proteins, okay? So absorptive, anabolic is really dominating here. Let's look at how that's different from post-absorptive, right? So overnight, you're not eating we're seeing nutrient levels decline in the blood and we enter this post-absorptive state. Now we see a lot more red, okay? So a lot more catabolic things happening. Your stored triglycerides are being converted to fatty acids that can now go to the bloodstream to be a fuel. That glycogen you stored, right? Glucagon, epinephrine are telling you we need glucose, right? We're gonna release that at least from the liver, we're gonna release that so that the brain has glucose. Heck, maybe we even do gluconeogenesis, right, to try to get more glucose from a non-glucose source, and our proteins can be converted to amino acids that either get released or run through um, as a fuel for cellular respiration. Again, fatty acids also um, can come down here and feed this. Remember, glucose, because the brain only uses glucose, Right? A lot of our cells, remember that whole glucose sparing effect from the endocrine system? We're gonna try to get cells in this post-absorptive time to really use fatty acids 
and to a lesser extent, amino acids. There's not a great source because you have to deal with all that extra ammonia. So that is what the post-absorptive state looks like. 